Hey there. In this episode, I share a story about why I hate hiking. Or at least, no, maybe I'm changing my story and how I used to hate hiking. This episode originally was supposed to be with uh, my friend Lex Lancaster, who joined me in the previous episode. But due to some tech issues, it's just me. But I'm telling a story how Lex was an important piece to me figuring out that I think I have exertional compartment syndrome. So now that I know, what does this mean? What am I going to do about it? How how this totally has been like mind-blowing to me in the last couple weeks. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey there and welcome. I'm Anna Hartman and this is Unreal Results a podcast where I help you get better outcomes and gain the confidence that you can help anyone, even the most complex cases. Join me as I teach about the influence of the visceral organs and the nervous system on movement, pain, and injuries, all while shifting the paradigm of what whole body assessment and treatment really looks like. I'm glad you're here. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Unreal Results Podcast. So, if you watched last week, you know that I'm missing my partner in crime, Lex Lancaster, who is, we filmed, we filmed and recorded an hour-long podcast, which I ended up breaking in into two podcasts. One, last week's, about her experience in her body with scoliosis, and um, so if you haven't checked that out. I'll link it in the show notes. Please check it out. It was a great podcast and it really highlights a lot of the uh, philosophies, methodologies of movement rev. So with that said, we also ended up talking about a similar experience I discovered in my body while going on a hike with Lex. And it was a great podcast and we were laughing and it was just super awesome. But unfortunately, I what went to edit it yesterday and accidentally deleted it and unfortunately the podcast software that i use descript is amazing as amazing and easy to edit as it is it does not have a archive or um, recovery mode for your deleted items so once it's deleted it's deleted forever and I was very sad about that because it was a great podcast and it was like pretty much done uh, being edited. I was just going to record a, a real quick intro and outro and but here I am having to re-record it, which is never fun, uh, never fun for me. Also, it's kind of sucks because the energy that Lex and I have versus just myself, it's really different, though, you know, I, I still feel like I'll get the story across for you um, now, but it's just ugh. a lesson in patience, a lesson in just don't delete things. I don't know why I was deleting. I just like don't like the I just don't like the chaos on my screen sometimes and I was deleting some other projects that I didn't need um and uh yeah I guess I pushed the wrong little button um so that sucks anyway so I'll tell you the story uh Lex and I were hiking in New Hampshire when I visited a couple weekends ago and um little fun fact about me though I love being outside in nature um, I love a good view. I love the forest. I mean, I grew up playing in the forest, grew up hunting, grew up like very outdoorsy. Um, and I still like, even at home, like I might not leave my house, but while I'm at home, like I'd rather be sitting outside in my hammock. I'm all about being outside. So you would, one would think an active person that likes to be outside would love hiking. But I, in fact, hate hiking. And when people ask me to go hiking, I would go. But then the whole it was a whole experience that was just miserable to me. 
it was uncomfortable. And then not only was it uncomfortable, it made me emotionally and psychologically feel like shit because because it was so uncomfortable, it really like ate at my self-esteem because I had this story about since I was overweight, I must be out of shape. That is why hiking feels so uncomfortable to me. And so Lex duped me into going on a hike by telling me it was a walk. She basically was like, I want to show you this spot in New Hampshire. It's one of my favorite places in the world, um, which is the Franconia Notch State Park. Uh, beautiful. She was right. It was like, I see why she loves it so much. But um, she's like, it's basically you can walk to it from you like you drive to it and then it's a short walk and I was like okay a short walk up a hill and she's like well yeah but like not bad and I was like okay that's fine I'll do it like it sounds short it sounds doable and like even though I know I hate hiking I don't like I often do it if it's if it's a new view like I'm all about new views like I'll sacrifice it for a new view so when when we were about to leave, um, her husband Kyle asked me, he's like, Anna, why do you hate hiking so much? And I was like, oh, well, because, and I was honest, I was like, hey, because it makes me feel super out of shape and it's really uncomfortable. Like, I find that feeling to be excruciatingly uncomfortable. Like, I didn't describe it in that moment as painful, but I was like, it just, it feels like crap. I was like, and I, why would I subject myself to that? And the older I've gotten, the more I've been like less of a people pleaser. And so when friends and people are like, let's go on a hike, unless it's something I really want to see, I'm just like, nah, I'd rather not. Which means that I've disappointed quite a few friends that come to visit and are like, oh, let's go a hike. And, and I'm like, oh, I don't really want to. So, um, and he was like, okay, yeah, that's fair, you know, and I was like, you know, I was like going upstairs, like no matter how in shape people are, like when you go upstairs, like most people get short of breath, even the athletes I work with, like that's just the nature of it. And that's what I was thinking it was for hiking. So anyways, Lex and I start on this trail, which is clearly from the beginning, not a walk, but a hike, it, but it's, it's an easy hike. I would say it's an easy hike. It wasn't like crazy technical it wasn't really steep it wasn't really long it was just not a walk <laughs> it was definitely a hike and within like maybe 10 minutes of the hike I said see see Lex this is why this is a hike like I'm and I'm already feeling uncomfortable and out of shape and she's like what why she's like you're not even really breathing hard and I was like yeah it's never about breathing hard like and I don't mind breathing hard and that's actually not what feels miserable to me I was like my lung it's never my lungs it's never my heart it's I was like and it's honestly not even like my quads or hips I was like it's my calves I was like within 10 minutes of a hike I start feeling so uncomfortable in my calves I was like because my ankles are tight you know I lack ankle mobility I was like um going up on in an incline just makes my calves feel like they're going to explode. And she's like, she kind of looked at me funny and she's like, both calves? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, really? And I said, yeah. And she's like, well, you know, in all the times I've ever hiked, I've never felt it in my calves. She's like, that's not normal. You don't, you don't normally feel, feel a hike in your calves. And I was like, what? What do you mean that's not normal? And she was like, yeah, I've never felt that. And she's like, and also, if it's both of your calves, are you sure you don't have a um, vascular issue or something? And I, it was like, for the first time, I was like, first of all, I was blown away that she had a different experience than me in her body. And this point goes back to, we're so used to... One, just taking other people's words for it that we don't ever really stop and sometimes think about how something feels in our body and if that is a different experience somebody else is having. And I just assumed since I was feeling this in my body and 
because I was believing like this story about the fact that I'm overweight, I'm out of shape, which which is not true at all. But it's like the 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 story that society tells us, right? Um, the world looks at me as an overweight person and just assumes I'm out of shape and not healthy, right? And even though I know that is not true, you can't help but be affected by that story because you're fed it over and over and over again, right? And so I just assumed that this is the experience everyone has and it's worse for me because of how I am. And I never, because there was so much shame around it, right? Because I would hate being slower on the walk. I would hate to admit that I was quote unquote out of shape, you know, like when I was hiking with friends, especially given the industry I work in, right? There's like a lot of shame involved in that. And so I wouldn't tell people what I felt. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even really tell myself what I felt all I all I really felt was like this is fucking uncomfortable and it wasn't until Lex gave me this opportunity to like share how I felt and share my feelings in a safe place right I didn't think she would judge me for not liking hiking I didn't think she would judge me for being out of shape it wasn't until she basically was asking me questions and then told me what her experience was that I was like oh my gosh, wait, you mean I'm not supposed to feel this way? And this is not normal. This is not a normal experience. And this is not a feeling of being out of shape. Like this is could be something else. And it was that in moment that I was sort of like got out of my own way and saw it, saw it as if a patient was telling me this. And I was like, holy shit. You mean you think I have exertional compartment syndrome? <laughs> and she started laughing. She's like, yes, I do. Something like that. And, and I was like, my mind was blown because then I start thinking about every time I felt this way, always on hikes, absolutely always on hikes. But then I was like, oh my gosh, this makes sense because so many, if I, if I used when it, back in the day when I used to do cardio in like a gym setting, you know, like VersaClaimer or elliptical or on the treadmill mill, I would always always my toes would go numb and it would be so frustrating and I and I thought I was like oh my toes are going numb my shoes must be too tight so I'd loosen my shoes and it kind of helped but not really and then I but I just had this belief that my shoes were too tight because my feet are wide which actually they're not even that wide but again this is just like the story we have about our bodies right and um it never really changed anything. And it was just something I lived with. And I just have, uh, eventually you just avoid those activities because they're uncomfortable, right? So I'm like, I'd rather do the bike than those other machines because I don't feel it on the bike. And um, so uh, then I was thinking about it. And the day before, when I flew up to New Hampshire, I was trying to make an earlier flight. So I was walking with quite a bit of pace through the um, Baltimore airport. And I was wearing my Birkenstocks and I started to feel that uncomfortable feeling in my, I say calves, but it's actually my entire lower leg. And so I was like, oh, I felt this yesterday in my low leg too. And I, I, my thought, my, my instant reasoning for it was a little bit of like, oh, I'm out of shape. But it was also like, oh, well, I'm walking in sandals quickly, and so I'm probably really trying to use my dorsiflexors to hold the sandal on, and, you know, I'm so I'm feeling it in the front of my shins a little bit. And, but then, as I keep thinking about it, I'm like, oh, because she's like, D- does it only bother you on inclines, or do you feel it on the way down? And I'm like, oh, no, I think it's just on inclines. But then I was like, no, I guess I felt it in the airport yesterday. And I guess often, sometimes on walks, I feel it too, but I'm just... Again, like I'm so quick to 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 blame it on something else, um, and especially my lack of ankle mobility. Though really, my ankle mobility is not that terrible, um, and it also wouldn't. It just doesn't make sense. Again, like sometimes, and this is why that like side lesson. This is why I think it's impossible 
for you to treat yourself. Like when you need help in your body, you have to go to someone that you trust to help you because as a clinician, it's it's hard to be your own patient because you just don't see things clearly because you can't get past your like ego brain that has all these stories wrapped up into it. Okay. So um, once she started asking me all these things, it was just getting me like reflect and be like, oh my gosh, the answer has been there all the time. This is not anything to do with how in shape I am. I, I do have like an, a compartment syndrome and Compartment syndrome is something I'm very aware of because I treat it very often because it's something that comes up in my clients quite a bit. Um, not an exertional compartment syndrome to the point that they need a fasciotomy, but a low level of it that happens from just poor like lymph congestion, uh, post um, ankle sprain or knee um, injury, you know, when there's a lot of swelling in their legs. Um, they're traveling so much. Some of them just, you know, yeah, have like some underlying like vascular entrapments that uh, make their lower legs prone to congestion. And we have these compartments in our low legs that don't leave a whole lot of space for congestion. And when there is congestion, it is like strangling the neurovascular structures and can be quite painful. And, um, create a diminished pulse and like affect us limit our mobility I mean a cascade of problems from it which is why I have so many and suggest so often to my clients that they use things like over-the-calf compression socks as a regular part of their recovery um so it's something I'm familiar with I just have never really thought about it for my own body um, so then Lex shared a story about a client that she had when she was a practicing physical therapist. She uh, was working with this woman on, in Alaska, um, who was in the same scenario. Every time that she would go for a hike, she would have excruciating pain and, you know, disability. And she saw a million practitioners. I mean, she was smarter, smarter than me because she realized that it wasn't normal and that something was wrong. And, um, because here I am just describing it as being uncomfortable, but if I had to put like a level of uncomfortableness to it and like a pain analog scale, it, I would say that um, most of the time when I'm hiking, it's like a pain in my lower legs, uh, like a nine out of 10 scale. So anyways, she was working with this woman and it's, you know, it basically the story was like she was listening to what she was saying and, and Lex was the first provider to be like, yeah, there is something wrong with you and the stretching your calves and doing these like bullshit exercises that you would do in like traditional rehab land, this is not right for you. And she found her like a very specific specialist in the Seattle, Washington area that she was like, I think you need to go get evaluated by this person. They'll, you know, test the pressure in your compartments and like determine, you know, give you a, an official diagnosis. But in the meantime, there is a very strategic way you can go about from a rehab standpoint to try to um, basically progressively load the compartments and progressively increase the pressure and then back off to sort of help your vascular system deal with this congestion in your low leg that gets created um, and pressure that gets exacerbated during exercise. And so, you know, it was basically like a protocol of you like, you know, you measure all the details like you're on a treadmill and you start walking and you at a specific speed in a specific incline and you go until you start feeling the increased symptoms and then you, you know, record the time, all the data, and then you start measuring your rest period and see how long your it takes during the rest period for your symptoms to come back to baseline. And then you sort of start again, right? So it's like a very progressive thing. And I'll share, Lex um, was talking about this paper that she got this information from. So I'll make sure I share that in the show notes for you too, if you're interested in it. Um, but basically, you know, the most important thing of the story was that she gave this woman hope and she gave this woman a like distinct 
more specific diagnosis of what she was feeling and a practitioner to go to to get an official diagnosis and also see what her options were, non-surgical and surgical. And, you know, Lex was a travel PT. So that was, you know, after she was done with that rotation, she left and um, she actually, the patient um, ended up having like life happen and like not continuing with her anyways. But recently, you know, within the last year or so, um, Lex had gotten a Facebook message from her. She found her on Facebook and the patient shared that um, she finally had gone to that specialist in Seattle and indeed was diagnosed with exertional compartment syndrome and ended up having surgery and felt so amazing and was so grateful for Lex for listening to her and like figuring out the issue with her um, because now she's can hike and be active with her kids and family and is like back to being able to enjoy that outdoors without such high levels of pain. And, you know, and that patient too had had a similar experience in her body where she was a little overweight and basically the regular doctors that she went to were basically like, it's because you're overweight, you need to lose weight. And, but then it's like a catch 22 because you can't really exercise because you're in such excruciating pain. And, and again, it's just that story that's perpetuated by society, um, which is not really what this podcast is about, but also it's kind of what this podcast is about. Um, so uh, it was that experience of dealing with this patient that Lex was able to look at me and be like, that's not a normal feeling you're feeling in your body. And this is, I talk about this sometimes too, is like permission she gave me, in that moment of saying, like, that's not a normal feeling, she gave me permission to be, like, validate what I was feeling and then also to be, like, it's not your fault and there's nothing wrong with you in terms of, like, this is not your, like, this is not your fault. Um, permission to feel what you're feeling and permission to speak up about it and also know that there could be a solution. And then that was, like, literally, we went on this hike Saturday morning or Saturday midday and it's all I could talk about for like a week after because it was mind-blowing to me because I it was like wait actually I can love hiking because I I do I I like like I said I love being outside but I didn't love nine out of ten paint so even within that hike as Lex and I were just discussing this um, I finally was like, hey, I need to stop because I'm getting to that level of like 9 out of 10 pain and I need a break. Normally, I, it's not that I don't do that on hikes with other people, but normally they would be ahead of me. And so once I got to them, they would wait for me and then I'd rest. And then I would only rest long enough for my respiratory rate and my heart rate to come back down. And because I'm actually not out of shape at all, that happens pretty fast because I am healthy. <laughs> My cardiovascular system responds quickly to rest. And so I wouldn't rest long enough for the pressure to drop in my lower legs. And then I'd start to go, start again, and I'd still be uncomfortable. And so you could imagine how that hiking experience sucked. Um, but this time with Lex, since we were looking at it from a lens of view of like, I have a medical condition and I have exertional compartment syndrome and my rest is not about my cardiovascular system. My rest is about how long does it take for my, the feeling of intense pressure and pain to come closer to baseline, right? And it took longer than I would have rested for, but it did finally go away. And then, then we started back up the hill. And then, you know, the last part of the hike, which was a hike. It was climbing up rocks. Um, <laughs> it was, this was definitely not a white walk. Um, and But the rest of it, I felt fine because I was like, the pressure was relieved and I felt better. And then on the way down, because it's like just less difficult, um, less exertion, um, I felt better. Uh, though, I so then I was just hyper aware. I had a, I had new language around 
what I was feeling in my body. It wasn't calf tightness. It wasn't calf soreness. In fact, when I think about it, I've never had like any delayed onset muscle soreness in my calves post hiking, post hiking, running, walking. That would make sense to the level of discomfort during the exercise. So I had this new language around what I was feeling in my calves. And I realized that, yes, it was an intense pressure around the entire container, not just my calves, with intense pain. And so then we drove back to her house, which was like, well, we drove to lunch, had lunch, and then drove back to her house. And we probably took to get back there like almost three hours. And it wasn't until maybe five minutes before we pulled into her driveway that I finally felt full release of the pressure and discomfort in my low leg. So it took, and then with this, with this feeling of pressure and discomfort, especially post-exercise, I had this feeling, this dead leg feeling, which is a very neural entrapment type of feeling. Um, and I never really had appreciated that until I was really paying attention and seeing an ex- like seeing my leg in my body in a different way, if, instead of being upset at it and mad at it and ashamed of it, being like, oh, this is interesting. This is not normal. And I want to pay attention to describe how it feels because I know as a practitioner, the better I can describe how I feel, the easier it is to understand what's going on. And so that would So then it was like, oh my gosh, 100% this is exertional compartment syndrome. And it really doesn't, it really makes sense for me because I also have lymph congestion issues in the rest of my body. So it would make sense that I am prone to exertional compartment syndrome because of that general lymph congestion. And so the wonderful thing about that too is this highlights that traditional treatment of compartment syndrome probably lacks this understanding of this systemic lymphatic and vascular congestion. And so this is a wonderful thing is I know how to treat this, right? Like I have my swelling reduction protocol that is so wonderful that in, of improving vascular flow and lymphatic congestion. I have um, acupuncture, um, connections right to like the points of my kidneys and liver and lymph system to support drainage um this last month i've also been um, working with a fdn practitioner so like functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner and realizing that my electrolytes are all my minerals are all out of, out of whack and this is part of what's holding on to all this congestion too and so adding in more potassium has been like a huge game changer in decreasing a lot of this general congestion in my body. And so there's so many other ways that we can approach treating exertional compartment syndrome besides just at the lower leg itself. So like I said, I'll share in the show notes the the study that Lex was discussing based on like the progressive loading because I definitely am going to try to do that now on my walks because like now, now that I've accepted what's going on, yes, I feel this on a general leisurely walk as well. Uh, the cool thing was yesterday I walked to a nail salon to get a pedicure. And then um, I noticed after the pedicure, which involves a massage of the lower legs, I felt much better. I, I went from, you know, feeling it at 10, 15 minutes into the walk to I didn't start feeling it until like almost 35 minutes into the walk after the massage. So that just tells me that supporting my vascular flow and lymphatics, I think, is going to be really helpful in this. Um, other things that have been helpful for my clients that I've treated with exertional compartment syndrome, besides the movement rep sewing reduction protocol, which I'll also link in the show notes. I did a whole podcast episode of it and have a course and everything, um, has been wearing compression socks and um, dry needling, specifically dry needling in the areas of where the compartments come to the skin. So it's sort of along like the anterior compartment right next to the tibia and then the lateral uh, compartment sort of, it's basically like the edges of the bones, if that makes sense. 
Um, so that's been really helpful in treating them too. Doing legs up the wall. It's no wonder I love legs up the wall and like often just feel throughout the day that I just have this drive to lay down on my back and eliminate gravity, right? Support like the reverse flow of things. And so, um, yeah, it just is, is, you know, there's a lot of ways to support people and it's no wonder, it's no wonder that, like I said, it's no wonder understanding the anatomy of the lower leg, which is all compartments, um, that this is actually what I'm feeling, right? So the lessons here are be careful of the stories you tell people as a practitioner, right? Be careful of the stories you tell people and exacerbate as a professional in the healthcare and wellness field because we are guilty of looking at overweight people and assuming that they're out of shape and that their weight is the problem. I've shared about this too in my journey with back pain right? Like that's something we practitioners have told people with back pain who are overweight for years or knee pain, foot pain, you name it, any pain. Basically, if someone's overweight, it's blamed on that. Um, I've talked about this with my mom's lung cancer diagnosis, right? It was just assumed because she was overweight. She was unhealthy and it was like, you know, she didn't get People don't take people seriously when they complain about their body when they're not looking a certain way. And so it is so subconsciously ingrained in us from society, (laughs) patriarchy, that we probably all have this unconscious bias. Even, Even people like me who are overweight, I still have can catch myself in this unconscious bias. So it's important to know, I, I speak to this in the mentorship a lot to my, the people I teach is like, be very carefree, careful of the stories you tell your patient because you have no idea how the body takes all the information it has and creates an output of a movement dysfunction or pain. Because that's what movement dysfunctions and pains are. It's just an output. And it's not your job to tell somebody a story of why they feel a certain way. Because most of the time, that's all it is, is a story. So oftentimes, my athletes will ask me to, like, why their knee hurts. And I, my answer to them is, like, I could tell you a story, but it would be just that, a load of bullshit. Because there is actually no way for me to know for sure. So... That's lesson one. Lesson two, always trust how you feel more than anything. And also, don't assume how you feel is how everyone will feel in that same scenario. And the only way to know is to speak up, right? The only way, the the whole, this whole thing came to fruition, came to realization is because for the first time, I put words to what was uncomfortable about hiking to someone who was listening and knowledgeable enough to be like, Anna, that's not normal. You are, you are, well, she's not saying I'm not normal, but she's saying what I'm feeling, the experience I'm having in my body doesn't have to be the experience I have in my body always for hiking. Like it could be changeable because that's not a typical experience and uh, so permission to speak up about how you feel and not blame it on something in your own body and then the other lesson here is treating exertional compartment syndrome or acute compartment syndrome for that matter systemically because it is a systemic issue your lower legs are just Your lower legs are really powerful pumps for our lymphatic and vascular system. And when they get overwhelmed, they can't be that for us. Or when they get overwhelmed, it could be a sign of overwhelm and congestion in other parts of the system. And if it is a systemic problem, it needs to have a systemic 
treatment to go with it as well. In fact, I just got a message, ironically enough, from one of my mentorship alumni on Voxer. She asked um, if I had any research resources on compartment syndrome because she's dealing with an athlete that has this. And so, so wonderful that I get to re-record this podcast for you uh, just to talk about it a little way. But know that something like this, compartment syndrome, whether it's in your lower legs or somewhere else, because we have compartments in our thigh, we can get compartment syndrome in our thigh, that um, it's a systemic issue. It's not just a problem there. Even if it's an acute compartment syndrome from like a contusion to the limb, you know, your baseball player gets hit with a baseball causes extra swelling and gets compartment syndrome. Part of the reason is because the body cannot deal with moving that swelling, right? So it's either overwhelmed because of all that acuteness, but we're designed to deal with it. And so if somebody's even getting acute compartment syndrome, to me, that means that there's some sort of entrapment that's not allowing that fluid to come back up the limb, right? So what's going on? Like, let's say it is a baseball player who gets hit in the shin. Like what's going on around their knee joint, their proximal tib fib joint? What's going on at their adductor hiatus, the bottom of their adductor canal? What's going on at the front of their hip, the top of the adductor canal? Because that adductor canal is a fascial space in the thigh that's really responsible for dra draining the fluid of our legs and keeping good vascular flow. So then too, like what's going on in their low back area and the, um, below their diaphragm? How How's their diaphragm functioning? Is there some stiffness in the diaphragm that's really impeding the flow there, right? Back to the heart. Or maybe even up at their left thoracic duct, are they stuck in scapular retraction and really like putting a clamp down on that left thoracic duct? There's so many spots that we can look to that are going to influence the entire system. So whether it's acute compartment syndrome or exertional compartment syndrome, more than likely there is a systemic piece to it. So looking at all these common spots, and again, going back to the podcast episode about the swelling reduction protocol, this is a good place to start. So hopefully this story was helpful for you. I will obviously continue to share my journey in dealing with it because um, I definitely want to be able to be the person that loves to go on a hike and, I and I'm so excited about the possibility of doing activities like this and returning to more walking, more running, um, hiking without such high levels of pressure and discomfort in my lower leg to know that it's like, I'm not, it's not anything wrong with me. Like I have a medical condition that's treatable. It's so empowering and so exciting. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I actually, I think I like hiking. Look at me. Look at us. So thank you to Lex Lancaster for listening to me and asking the right questions. So I got out of my own way and listened to myself and uh thank you for listening to this episode i'll see you next week